Hello again, everyone. Uh, so we are almost ready to start the first Ramanujan lecture by Professor Shorab Chatterjee. But before that, I invite our director, Professor Ajesh Gopakumar, to give a short welcome address. Hello. Uh, good evening and welcome, everyone, to this uh, uh, Ramanujan lecture, which I'm delighted that uh, we have uh, Professor Saurav Chatterjee here. Uh, you'll hear, of course, from him, and I won't take very long uh, uh, before that, but uh, my job right now is to uh, t give you a brief overview of what ICTS is. Some of you have been here before and probably know all about ICTS, but for those of you uh, who are here for the first time, uh, uh, let me just give you a, a quick overview. So uh, ICTS is a new institution. It's a new center of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research with a unique mandate uh, of uh, combining uh, our in-house research, about which uh, I'll just say a few words uh, soon, uh, but uh, together with uh, programs like this one, uh, in which uh, researchers from all over the world uh, and, of course, uh, all over India uh, uh, come uh, to, uh, to talk, uh, to, to work on uh, some exciting frontier problems. Uh, and uh, uh, both these are also integrated with our outreach, and uh, you will see even in the course of this program, uh, there, there are several public lectures and, uh, and others uh, which uh, aim to convey some of the excitement of science to the public. In some ways, uh, we are mo uh, modeled after uh, several of these peer institutions, but in some unique uh, amalgam of these, uh, uh, which uh, with, uh, 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 in the Indian context, especially being sensitive to the requirements of the Indian scientific uh, ecosystem. So it's quite unique in India uh, to, uh, to have this uh, um, mix, and in many ways even internationally, and in that sense, uh, I believe uh, a, a lot of people have felt the possibilities uh, are uh, are very uh, uh, there are lots of possibilities for Indian science uh, in this uh, format. So uh, this is how the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the campus was supposed to uh, uh, look like by the architects in 2012 or so, and this is how it sort of. Uh, 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 has now, um, in 2017, uh, we now have a fully operational campus with all the facilities that you've all seen. Uh, if you haven't seen this library next door, I urge you to just step in and look at it. It's one of the more uh, interesting designs in, on campus. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, about uh, the campus itself. But uh, uh, going back to our research, and I think these are uh, this is an old version of the slides, I think, uh, because we uh, I had put in a new version which has Riddhi and Anirban and, and so on, but they, ha they don't seem to have loaded that. Uh, anyhow, uh, our research is, has uh, a very youthful faculty, and uh, and they work in a number of areas. Uh, which um, at the moment uh, we have areas in mathematics, which you can roughly group into probability, geometry, mathematical physics, dynamical systems, PD, big data, but also in uh, physics, in astrophysics and complex systems, string theory, quantum field theory, and quantum gravity. Uh, but we, these groupings are very fluid, and there's a lot of crosstalk across uh, many of these areas, which I think is a uh, strength of ICTS. Uh, so about the programs, we've had a number of programs in, uh, in a variety of areas, not just the ones in which we, uh, we have researchers. Uh, uh, but I want to emphasize that we are not a conference center or a funding node, uh, but we act as a science hub and an enabling platform, which in many ways can transform Indian science and take it to a sort of a uh, higher level by, uh, by this uh, chemistry between uh, our researchers, the programs, and so on. Uh, and what distinguishes the ICTS programs are, roughly speaking, in its format, its duration, organization, and directions. For instance, the format, there's often a strong pedagogical component, 
many lecture courses, and I think this uh, program is no exception. And uh, the idea is, of, is to train junior researchers who want to enter a new area. And the lectures are archived on our YouTube channel and in a way create knowledge capital for the whole country. Uh, and in many ways, that's much more cost effective than sending Indians to schools uh, outside the country. So in terms of duration, again, it's different from the conference uh, uh, durations. It's typically two weeks, three weeks, I think, in this case. Uh, and uh, can even be up to a semester long. And it's an opportunity for people from around the world to come and spend an extended period of time and strike up collaborations, which uh, I think uh, the opportunities here, uh, the being on a, a campus uh, and staying uh, on site uh, gives you more opportunities to spend uh, uh, long working hours together. Uh, and it's also a chance for the younger generation who are staying in campus too to interact informally with some of the top scientists and in that process integrate India with global science. Uh, we are also a node for various international uh, institutional cooperation with a number of institutions uh, outside the country as well. In terms of the organization of the programs, we have an open program submission uh, 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 proposal system. And um, in fact, we just had a call out for proposals from April 2020 to uh, September 2020. Uh, we'll soon have another call open till the middle of this year uh, for programs to be organized from uh, October 2020, so the six months following uh, from October. So uh, anyone uh, can uh, submit proposals here. And it's vetted by a program committee, which comprises of experts from all over India, uh, with, together with some active shaping by uh, people from ICTS. Uh, in many ways, that active uh, role uh, is, uh, is part of the ICTS mandate so that uh, one suggests new topics or broaden scopes, or we use the memory of past ICTS programs to, to, uh, 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 to make sure that a given proposal is, uh, is the most effective uh, in, uh, in its uh, task. And we often rope in many other experts and ensure there is um, adequate lecture component or pedagogical component etc. And we also encourage organizers to form a long-term association uh, uh, with ICTS. We try to especially encourage new initiatives, new directions for research, uh, and we've had, and, uh, and these are some examples of uh, 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 some topics which uh, I think uh, uh, were uh, innovative in, in India in having brought uh, certain areas to the attention of the scientific uh, community and uh, hopefully creating uh, expertise as we go along, especially through follow-ups. Uh, and, uh, and in many ways, we've also had programs which uh, have linked with industry and try to sort of open up knowledge channels from basic sciences to perhaps more applied areas. Uh, in terms of numbers, we've had um, uh, 139 programs, 64 discussion meetings, uh, and a large number of participants. In the average number now is, after we moved to our campus, is sort of about 2,000 participants per year, and about 30 programs and discussion meetings uh, in a given calendar year. Uh, and um, so that's, uh, uh, and if you see the 2019 calendar, it's uh, quite full. And so there's a large demand for having uh, these programs, which is very heartening that it seems to fulfill a need within the Indian scientific community. Uh, and we have various special lecture series, and the Ramanujan lecture series here is in that uh, line. We will also have this week, actually, Chandrasekhar lecture series by an eminent astrophysicist, uh, Rashid Sunyaev. We have a distinguished lecture tomorrow by Dick Bond, and a Vishweshwara lecture next week by Lyman Page. So uh, some of these special lectures, perhaps you will have the opportunity to also attend. Uh, uh, even if they're not in your area. Uh, this is a sampling of various uh, 
uh, topics that, um, um, uh, just to give you an idea of the, uh, of the scope of the programs we've had, which of course are in physics, but in also quantitative biology and mathematics uh, and computer science and so on. So, um, uh, finally, let me just say uh, something about the outreach activity, which again we take very seriously. Uh, we have had a large number of public lectures by eminent scientists, uh, which are uh, all again on the same YouTube channel and uh, which have proved to be very popular. Uh, uh, we have special CDs called the Einstein Lectures, uh, in which we partner with institutions around the country. Uh, we had some special outreach events in the 100 year to mark the centenary of general relativity and uh, uh, the time of the Mathematics of Planet Earth initiative where we organized an exhibition with some partner institutions and at this local science museum with a large number of attendees. So that's uh, uh, the uh, flagship outreach event which we've been running for the last two years is Copy with Curiosity. So Copy is coffee uh, in Canada. And this is a monthly series at the Planetarium. And uh, which uh, the, the nice thing about it is that we keep a lot of time after the talk uh, uh, for discussions uh, in a, uh, with, the, uh, with the audience, and that has, uh, uh, that elis has elicited a, a very enthusiastic response from school, college students, uh, and even uh, it's live streamed and you get a lot of questions also from the audience, uh, 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 from the audience in uh, various parts of the world. So that's something we, uh, we are very happy about. And there's a copy with Curiosity this coming Sunday as well at the Planetarium, and it's by one of the cosmologists uh, on observing the universe. Uh, uh, um, and these were some special events we had a year ago, uh, uh, the ICTS at 10, for which Saurav was here, and resulting uh, sort of uh, allied events on the uh, panel discussion on the usefulness of useless knowledge, uh, and uh, uh, a wonderful public lecture by Kip Thorne. So that sort of crowned our 10th uh, anniversary uh, celebrations, and we have now been uh, uh, going ahead uh, based on that momentum. And I hope uh, you people will be coming back to ICTS again in coming years, and uh, hope to see you then. So thank you very much. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Saurabh Chatterjee for the Ramanujan Lectures. Uh, Saurabh uh, was born in 1979 in, in Kolkata, uh, which is the year I finished my undergraduate studies. Uh, he did MSTAT in 2002. Uh, I remember having taught him. He was completely bored in class. He was uh, because he could quickly uh, grasp what was being taught. Uh, I was always impressed by his novel ideas and questions about uh, different things and, and, the, and the proofs. It was obvious that uh, his thought process is very unique. There have been a string of brilliant uh, recent young probabilists from, from the institute, I mean the Indian Statistical Institute, and some of them are here in the audience. Uh, I'm sure they derive a lot of inspiration from sort of, uh, they make us all proud and keep us motivated. On his part, sort of maintains strong connections with his roots. I remember in my recommendation for his application for graduate studies in the US, I had rated him as the best student I ever had. And uh, I looked it up again this morning in my computer to make uh, that, that's what exactly I wrote. He obtained his PhD from Stanford uh, in 2005 under the supervision of Percy Diaconis. Uh, I would uh, urge, if you have a few minutes, to read the acknowledgement of his PhD thesis. Uh, he was an uh, assistant professor at UC Berkeley, and then an associate professor there. He also spent a few years at, at the Courant Institute between 2009 and 13, And then eventually, he's now, now a uh, professor in statistics and mathematics since 2013 at Stanford. Uh, he, be he became a professor at the age of 34. Uh, his works are in the area of, of uh, majorly in Stein's method for normal approximation, large deviation for random graphs, nonlinear large deviations, spin glass theory, among many others. More recently, problems in mathematical physics, like gauge theories, Young-Mills, etc. 
He has brought new insights and great clarity in many of these classical areas. His hallmark of his research, as I, according to me, is that he discovers connections between apparently diverse areas, bridges them with very novel techniques. He has written two books, uh, Super Concentration and Related Topics in 2014, Large Deviations for Random Graphs in 2017. Shorov, of course, has been a recipient of several awards and honors, Sloan Fellowship in 2007, Tweedy New Research Award from IMS in 2008, Rollo Davidson Prize in 2010, Dublin Prize in 2012, IISA Young Researcher Award in 13, Loeb Prize in 2013. He was elected a fellow of IMS in 2018. Sorov is an expositor of unusual clarity. His notable lectures uh, include invited talk at ICM 2014 and send floor lectures in 2015. It is, in, it is an immense pleasure to welcome him to give the Ramanujan lectures, and I'm sure the audience here will enjoy them thoroughly. Thank you, and welcome, Saurabh. I'd like to uh, ask uh, Professor Arup Bose to hand over a small memento to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Professor Saurabh Chatterjee on behalf of ICTS. Um, so thanks for the invitation. It's a, it's a great honor to be, to be here, to be giving these lectures. And, um, and thanks to Arupda for the very generous introduction. Um, so, um, so today, um, this talk, um, so what, I, what I'm going to tell you is a, is a very compressed uh, exposition of a very, very long story, and I'll tell you four open problems. If you're looking for open problems, I see there are many young people in the audience. Um, and, uh, and there'll be reading references. So this talk is just an introduction. Of course, as I said, it's a very long story, so um, it'll be very compressed. And, and, um, and there'll be, if you want to learn more about it, there'll be references at the end. And in general, faces are familiar with this story. So this, this talk is mostly for mathematicians. So that's what I'm going to assume that I'm, I'm talking to, to mathematicians. Uh, but maybe there'll be something for phrases also, but uh, it's mostly an introduction and, uh, you know, uh, you'll see in the, in the next, uh, the second and third talks will be more technical, so that's what I was told, this, this will be a general you know, talk and uh, technical talks, the second and third should be technical. So, um, so okay, so let me um, tell you a little bit about quantum field theory. So I'm assuming that uh, this is a, as I said, this is a mathematical audience, and uh, you know most mathematicians don't know what's a quantum field theory. So I'm going to tell you what's a quantum field theory very briefly. Okay. It's a huge, huge thing. But uh, um, so, so what quantum field theories do is that they explain uh, interactions between elementary particles, and you can make predictions. You can calculate. You can you know make predictions and match your experiment. And there is this uh, thing called the standard model, which um, encapsulates all our knowledge uh, of elementary particles. Um, uh, and yang mills theories are, are certain kinds of uh, important quantum field theories that uh, constitute the standard model. So these are also... Um... Okay, so now the question, what is the quantum field theory? That's what I started with. And this is not completely clear. What, what is this object? So I'll tell you uh, why is this not clear, even though it is widely, widely used and uh, you know, people use it. So, so in what sense it is not clear what it is? I'll tell you that. Uh, and, uh, and this may seem paradoxical, but even though it's not clear, um, uh, physicists can calculate and make uh, very accurate predictions. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so how, how is that possible? Okay. Um, and you know, on the mathematical side, uh, the construction of quantum field theories, or more specifically Young-Mills theories, is one of the seven millennium problems posed by the Clay Institute. So it's a Clay problem, construction of Young-Mills Young theories. And so what does that mean? So if you go and read the problem description, it's, it's kind of hopeless. You, you, unless you ha really have a background on this, you wouldn't understand what they're talking about. So, so that's, that's what I'm going to tell you, what, what they're talking about. Okay. okay. Um, so very, starting from the very basics, so you have space-time, which is R4, mathematically. And then you have restricted Lorentz transforms. So I'll, uh, without going into definition, it's a gr group of linear transformations of space-time. So just like rotations are a group of transformations for R3, you have these restricted Lorentz transformations. These are a group of trans linear transformations of R4. And then you have this other group called the Poincare group, uh, which is pairs 
Um, one is an element of R4, one is the, one is the restricted Lorentz transform, so it's mathematical is, is a semi-direct product of R4 and uh, this restricted Lorentz transforms, and it acts as follows. So what you do is you apply this kind of uh, rotation, not, not a rotation, it's a Lorentz transform, so it's kind of something like a rotation, and then you add a, um, uh, you translate. So this is, this is the Poincare group. Okay, so that's the, that's the action. Um, uh, what, and then there is a rule for taking products, as you can imagine what it is. And what is special relativity? Um, it tells you that the laws of physics remain invariant under change of coordinates by the action of the Poincare group. So it's just like in Newtonian mechanics, uh, if you change space by, rota by rotation and a translation, the laws of physics should remain unchanged. Okay? So just like that, special relativity tells you that uh, if you do this, uh, you apply this, uh, an element of the Poincare group to R4, and, and you have a new coordinate system, the laws of physics will remain unchanged. Now, who applies that? Okay, so that's what uh, relativity tells you. That is, if you, have, if you are observing space-time, uh, if you're a stationary observer, you're observing space-time according to some coordinate system, and then there's some other observer who is moving away from you at a constant velocity, that other observer will observe space-time in a different coordinate system, which is obtained by an action of a certain um, element of this uh, Poincare group. Okay, so that's, that's how relativity operates. I'll not, not go into details, you get the general idea. This is what it is. Now, quantum field theory is um, the most successful attempt to uh, combine special relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, so what quantum field, field theory does is um, you want to model the behavior of a physical system, for example, a collection of elementary particles, where the number of particles need not remain constant over time, so it can change over time. So it need not be a fixed number of particles, but just a collection of elementary particles. And there are these two basic components. One is the Hilbert space, and the other is a unitary representation of uh, this Poincaré group in this Hilbert space. So since I'm assuming it's, it's a mathematical audience, I'll, I'll assume that you know what's a representation, what's the unitary representation. And uh, if you are not familiar with projective, don't worry about this, so just think of it as unitary representation. So these are these two basic components of, um, of a quantum field theory. Now, what is it? You know, where, where, does, where do these things come? So here are the assumptions. Here is how these, these things relate, relate this system of particles. Um, so in, so a bit, one of the basic roadblocks to extending quantum mechanics, uh, to combining quantum mecha mechanics and special relativity, is that in quantum mechanics you have a definite notion of time evolution, whereas in special relativity there is no specific notion. So if, if two events happen at the same time, to an observer, they can, they can happen at different times to a different observer. So the, the notion of um, events happening at a time, at the same point of time changes depending on the, this, this thing about making sense of time evolution becomes very tricky. So here, the, here is the assumption. So in quantum field theory, the state of the system is not the state at a given time. It's a whole space-time uh, system. So the state of the system appears to, uh, to an observer as some, some vector in this Hilbert space, and if this is known, one can compute probabilities of various events. So this is how quantum mechanics operates. So if, I were, if, you, if the state is known as an element of a Hilbert space, you can use it to compute probabilities. Now, here is the key thing. Uh, so suppose you have a different observer who is using a coordinate system obtained by the action of some element of this Poincare group. Then what this tells you is that, what the, the assumption is that to that observer, the same system will appear to be in a state which is not psi, but something else, which is um, this unitary matrix times psi. Okay? And the representation property ensures this is consistent. So if you apply two successive um, uh, you know, change of coordinates, uh, it's equivalent to applying the comp composition of these coordinates. So that's where the representation property comes from. Okay? So, so quantum field theory says that this, there is a state of the system which is just the same. It's a, it's a combined, you know, full space-time um, state of the system, and it just changes depending on the observer. Okay. So when you observe a system evolving in time, I'll come to that in the next slide if it's confusing to you. When you observe a system evolving in time, it's it's not as if the system is changing. The system has a fixed state throughout whole of space-time, but is that it's just that you since you are moving ahead in time you you are observing the system to be in different states as you go along in time okay so here is um, more explicitly time evolution 
So suppose the stationary observer at, is at some spatial location at the origin at, and observes the physical system to be in some state at time zero. Then um, after time has evolved by time t, uh, you are in a new quadrant system, which is obtained by just translating the old system. You do not do any Lorentz transformations. And, um, and then uh, the, new, the system will appear as a different state after time t, which is by the action of this group, uh, of, this, of this matrix, um, uh, on this original state, um, of this operator on this original state. And then you can show that uh, by Stone's theorem, there is a theorem which tells you that you can actually produce a sulfur joint operator so that this relation is satisfied, and this is called the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian emerges automatically from this setup. Okay? So it's a, you know, it's hard to take in, but this is the, if you, if you uh, have not completely followed what I have said, uh, you know, just remember that uh, in quantum field theory, you have a Hilbert space and a unitary representation. These, this, this pair of things defines uh, a quantum field theory that describes the state of the system. And then if, if a different observer is moving at different velocity, there will be a different change of coordinates. Okay. So now, what is a quantum field? Suppose you are given this quantum field theory, which is this Hilbert space and the unitary representation. A quantum field is a hypothetical function. It's, a, it's an abstract object, which, when integrated against the smooth test function, yields an operator on the Hilbert space. So, so this is like, you know, in, in this sense, is the operator value distribution. So what is a distribution? A distribution is, a, is an object. When you integrate against a test function, you get, um, you get a number. Okay? Here is your, you have an abstract object. When you integrate against some test function, you get an operator. Okay? So that's a, that's a quantum field. Now, how does it relate to our quantum uh, field theory that I just described in terms of the Hilbert space and this uh, unitary representation? Uh, it has to satisfy so that there is a quantum field related to our physical system, uh, which satisfies this kind of uh, you know, covariance property. Uh, you know, it has to change in a certain way when you pre and post multiply by these, uh, these groups. And uh, this quantum field associated to the system, so this object is sort of a mathematical tool that is used to calculate various things related to the system. So in practice, you don't really work with the unitary representation. What you work with is, a, is, a, is this quantum field. And that allows you to do, the, do calculations of related to the system. Okay, so there are these three objects. You have Hilbert space, the unitary representation, and then you have the quantum field, which allows you to do various kinds of calculations. Okay, so this is the whole setup. Okay, um, okay so here is, here is where the math comes in. This is, so as I said, you know, the, till now, you know, this seems pretty clear that, okay, so you have the Hilbert space, you have the unitary representation, you have some object, which is a quantum field, which I have not made clear what it is, but let's not worry about that. Uh, so where, where is the problem? Okay, so the, here is, I'll tell you now, where is the problem? So suppose you want to make a mathematically consistent um, object. So these, uh, these are, there are these axioms called the Whiteman axioms, and this is the most popular ap approach to giving a fully rigorous definition of, uh, of quantum field theory. And this is essentially a more precise version of what I just said, okay, with a uh, few, few other things. So, so they, they include some additional conditions on these, these objects uh, uh, and some assumptions about unique vacuum state and so on. So there are some additional assumptions. And uh, these assumptions come from, um, from the physics. So, uh, so, phys so phys physics tells you what kind of assumptions you need to put to avoid physical incons inconsistencies. And it has been possible to construct certain very simple quantum field theories, very basic objects known as free fields, that satisfy these, wash, uh, these Whiteman actions. Okay? So this uh, kind of triple, um, the Hilbert space, the unitary representation, the quantum field phi, this operator value distribution, and uh, this vacuum state, these have all been constructed. These free fields have been constructed, which satisfy these, um, these conditions. And um, so these free fields, however, describe very trivial systems of particles that do not interact with each other. So you just have a very boring system of particles which does not interact uh, with, uh, between themselves. And, uh, and so this, this kind of a system has been, uh, you know, people have been able to construct. However, um, at least in the cases of interest in four dimensions, uh, no one has been able to rigorously construct a quantum field theory satisfying these axioms um, which describe an interacting system of particles. 
So, so you have this very basic system of axioms. It's just, it just says, you know, there should be Hilbert space, there should be a representation, there should be a cooperative value distribution which satisfies certain conditions. And then, you know, there have been some constructions of these free fields. And then I'll tell you later on, in, you know, if you reduce the dimension of space-time from four down to two or three, there have been non-trivial constructions, but that's, that's not, the real, those are the, not the, real, the realistic models. But for four-dimensional space-time, no one has been able to construct uh, a, an interacting quantum field theory. Okay. So that's, okay, so that's the problem. Now, as I told you, that one can do calculations. So the question is, if you cannot even define the theory, how can you do calculations? You know, if you cannot even define the theory in a mathematically uh, you know, precise way, how can you do calculations? So what is usually done is um, these perturbative expansions. So, so what uh, physicists do is that they assume that the desired uh, you know, quantum field theory is a small perturbation of the free field. The free field is, you know, one, ha one is able to rigorously define the free field, or, uh, you know, even, you know, directly, um, and do a kind of Taylor expansion around this, okay? Now, this, this can be immensely complicated. So, this, here is where, you know, you have all these Feynman diagrams and uh, renormalization and all kinds of things come in. But these are basically um, perturbative expansions around the free field. Now, the problem is, from the mathematical side, there is actually a theorem um, which says that the Hilbert space for an interacting theory cannot be the same as the Hilbert space for a non-interacting theory. If you, if you want to do that, you, uh, you know, if you want to construct uh, a system on the same Hilbert space, you will, you will just end up with the free field. Suppose you have constructed the free field on, on some Hilbert space, and, and then you want to, okay. So, so, the, so the issue is that this perturbative expansion that you are doing, the Hilbert space itself has to change. So, you know, you cannot have a Taylor expansion of a Hilbert space, right? So, uh, so you cannot say one Hilbert space is like perturbation of the other. So, so in, in most cases, this is one of the major problems, is that it's not even clear what the new Hilbert space is. What, what is the Hilbert space on which this, this, um, this theory is defined? Okay. Uh, however, one can still go ahead with these calculations, and they have, uh, you know, uh, these amazing uh, degrees of accuracy that you have in quantum electrodynamics, and so, so clearly, it's, you know, something is going on, uh, but it's not clear um, how to do this mathematically. So, so here is, you know, just to summarize, you have this whole setup, this, uh, first of all, the setup itself is very complicated. It's not some simple thing. Um, you know, you have, you, you need to build a Hilbert space, you need to build a unitary representation, uh, and you need to uh, have, have it relate to an actual model that uh, has been described in some other way. Uh, but then, uh, and then you have the set of axioms which have to be satisfied for the physics to be correct. Um, and then you have all this, and then, you just discovered that, you know, after you know, 60 years of efforts uh, or 50 years of efforts, uh, you know, nobody has been able to uh, actually come up with, with something that worked. So, so let me tell you what is the what is the approach. Uh, this uh, there is this there is a probabilistic approach which which is uh, where you know, I got interested because you know I'm a probabilist. Um, so there is this uh, area called constructive QFT. Um, so there's a probabilistic approach to constructing quantum field theories to satisfy the Whiteman actions. And as I told you in the previous slide, it has not been successful in, in four dimensions, but still let me tell you what it is. So it goes as follows. First, you construct a random field on R4 whose probability law is related to, desire, to the desired QFT in a certain way. So I'll not go into details of that, but uh, there is a way, you know, um, by which you can construct a random field which is related to your target quantum field theory. So random field is just, uh, you know, random distribution, let's say. Um, yeah, it's usually it's a random distribution, not a random function. So this is called the Euclidean quantum field theory, this, uh, this psi. Now, this, the next step is to show that this random field satisfies a certain set of conditions known as the oster walder shared conditions. Okay, so now you have this random object. Suppose you can construct it. That's the first hurdle, but suppose you can. Then you show that it satisfies a certain set of axioms known as the Osterwalder Schrader axioms, or they should be called conditions, but whatever. And if, this, you, if you can show this, then there is a reconstruction theorem that takes this field and using that reconstructs your quantum field, it reconstructs the Hilbert space. Okay, that's challenging, you know, how, how, what is the Hilbert space? So they, they figured that out. 
how do you construct the Hilbert space, the unitary representation, the quantum field, the vacuum state? You construct all of that. If you can, if you can construct a random field, um, and you can show that it satisfies the set of actions. Okay. And in general, um, this quantum field theory that you construct is non-trivial. That is, it describes a system of interacting particles if and only if this original field that you started out with is non-Gaussian. And so that's usually quite complicated to show that it's non-Gaussian. Okay. Very challenging to do that. Or Okay, so this program was initiated in the 60s um, and uh, was successful in constructing non-trivial quantum field theories when the dimension of space-time is reduced from 4 to 2 or 3. Okay. Uh, so that's not realistic, but uh, let's, let's do that. Uh, but not yet in dimension 4. So in di now, even in dimensions 2 and 3, it's not really the, the really interesting quantum field theories. What they were able to do is um, construct these, uh, these toy... QFT is the 5-4 theory. It's the 5-4 theory in two dimensions and 5-4 theory in three dimensions. So I'll not go into what is that. So these, these are the things that we're able to construct. Okay, and this 5-4 theory is itself, uh, you know, it's a very uh, complicated thing to construct this uh, rigorously. Now, so now let's come to Yang-Mills theory. So what are these Yang-Mills theories? So these five four theories are mathematically interesting objects, but they describe no real physical system. These are just toy models. Um, and uh, and for, for real uh, particles, one has to consider these four-dimensional Yang-Mills theories. Um, and so if you, if you go from 4D to 2D, um, we more or less understand what are 2D Yang-Mills theories right now. In three and four dimensions, um, there was a lot of work, I'll come more uh, I'll talk more about that a little later, uh, by Balaban and others. Uh, however, the question is still, still open, and that's why it's one of the clay problems. And even the first step in this approach, which is the construction of the random field, without the next steps, that is verification of the oster walter schrader axioms or construction of Hilbert space and unitary representation and all that, uh, even that um, is open. So we'll now talk about that. Okay, so uh, here, here you are, Euclidean Yang-Mills theories. Uh, so recall that the first step in the probabilistic approach was to construct um, a random field known as Euclidean quantum field theory. And Mills theories, these fields are called Euclidean Yang-Mills theories. Um, and although we know how to construct these in two, and, uh, two dimensions, in space-time dimension two, or we, they have not really been in dimensions three and four. So the four is the real case, but even in dimension three, we have not been able to. Uh, and without going into the details, um, these theories are supposed to be scaling limits of lattice gauge theories. These are well-defined objects. So, so starting from the next slide, I think, I'll be able to actually talk about a rigorous mathematical uh, definition. Um, and so, so this is something that probabilists um, have been doing for a while. That is, you take discrete things and you try to describe their scaling limits. And this is uh, what my talks are about. Okay. So let's, let's define a lattice gauge theory. So let's, uh, there's a complete definition. So let D be the dimension of space-time, which is the most important case is D, D equals 4, and G be a matrix Lie group. Uh, the most important cases are, you know, G is SU2 or SU3 or some other, you know, small, low-dimensional, non-abelian group. Um, so you take a finite su a subset of the lattice ZD, and then you define a lattice gauge theory with gauge group G on this finite subset as follows. Um, suppose that for any two adjacent vertices, we have uh, a group element that is a matrix, little matrix attached to that edge, with the restriction that if you reverse the orientation of the edge, the matrix gets inverted. Okay? That's the only restriction. And uh, let G lambda denote the set of all such configurations. Okay? So you, you attach group elements to edges with the restriction that if you uh, reverse the edge, uh, the group element uh, gets inverted. And with this restriction, let G lambda denote the set of all such configurations. And then you have, uh, um, uh, then you take any square in this, um, in this lattice so a square bounded by four edges is called a plaquette. That's one of the basic objects in the lattice gauge theory. So you have, 
you have a, uh, the dimension d can be anything, but uh, the plaquette is always this two-dimensional little square. And then you attach group elements to plaquettes as follows. So suppose you have a plaquette with vertices x1, x2, x3, x4 going in this order in some fixed order. And then you multiply the group elements along, um, along these edges, and then you get a group element attached to a plaquette. So that's called, uh, that's up, that's called the up. And then you define this quantity, which is you take uh, the identity minus this up, take the trace of that, take the real part of the trace, and sum over all plaquettes. Uh, that's called the Wilson action. For some reason, that's, that's important. And uh, if you look at what this action is doing, um, you know, this becomes small if, um, if these are close to identity. So if these UPs are all close to identity, this becomes small, and that's if you don't leave. So that's, that's, where, that's where it's getting small. Okay. Yes. You're restricting to for lambda. Uh, that's just to provide, put it in a finite volume. Is that what you? Yeah. So I'll, I'll take infinite volume after. F first define this, and then I'll take infinite volume. Yeah. Yeah. So then, then what you do is you take the product Haar measure on G lambda, uh, and then you define a new measure, um, which is this. So you take e to the minus beta times this Wilson action. Uh, so, you, so, so you take your base measure as a measure where the, all these matrices are from the Haar measure and then you tilt it by multiplying by e to the minus beta times the Wilson action. And that's, the, that's lattice gauge theory on lambda. Okay. So this is, this is uh, called lattice gauge theory on this set lambda with gauge group G with inverse coupling strength beta. And then you take an infinite volume limit of this theory as the weak limit of these measures as lambda increases to ZD. Okay. So then it's, uh, it's not really settled whether these infinite volume limits are unique or not, but you can always take a weak limit of these things. So, so you can define lattice gauge theory on the full, full lattice. Okay. okay, so that's a lattice gauge theory. Okay. So it, uh, it's, a, it's a way of defining a probability measure on a, on the set of configurations where a configuration refers to matrix elements attached to edges of the lattice. Okay, so here is the first open problem that I promised you. Uh, this is the problem of Yang-Mills existence, uh, which is to define the scaling limit of lattice gauge theory, uh, which is taken by, um, first define the theory instead of the original lattice, to take it on the scale lattice, epsilon times ZD, and then send epsilon to zero. Now, to, to obtain an interesting limit object, one has to vary this parameter beta as epsilon goes to zero. And it's generally believed that in dimension three, beta has to, has to scale like some multiple of one over epsilon, and in dimension four, it is, uh, beta has to scale like some multiple of log one over epsilon. So that's the general belief. And, um, and then, you know, non-abelian cases are the interesting cases. Now, there are various roadblocks, uh, if you're a mathematician, you're trying to obtain this kind of scaling limit, so we have been doing scaling limits for a long time. As I said, you know, Brownian motion is a scaling limit of random walk, and you know, various, uh, you know, the Shin free field is a scaling limit of many different things. So, so we have been doing scaling limits. Now, here, it's not clear a priori what space it should belong to. So that's one problem. That it's, uh, you know, one has to first figure out what is the limit. Uh, what it, Like, uh, you know, if you, have, if you have a limit object, so for example, Brownian motion is the scaling limit of random walks. And then it turns out we, we have figured out by now that uh, the, co the correct space is a space of continuous functions on the interval 0, 1. You know, continuous real valued functions. That's where, um, so a Brownian motion is a random object of that space. So here, what is the space? Okay. So, uh, so, yeah, so it, it should be, you know, some space of connections on, on a, you know, principal bundle, but, you know, it's not clear what's the smoothness of the, of the space of connections that one has to consider, and so, you know, it's not clear what, what the space should be. Um, now, even if one is somehow able to obtain a scaling limit, which, uh, a scaling limit, which would be a big result by itself, um, it is important to prove that it is non-trivial, meaning that it's a non-Gaussian field, okay? On whatever space is defined on, 
um, it has to be a non-Gaussian element in some sense. Okay. So it cannot be like Brownian motion, that which is Gaussian. So the one has to have a non-Gaussian limit. And then finally, if one has that, then one has to be able to construct a, a quantum field theory using this field. So this, this just gives you the probabilistic field. Then you have to verify that it satisfies the Oster Osterwalder Schroeder axioms. And maybe it will not fall into that framework. Maybe the space on which this limit is defined does not fall into the framework of Osterwalder Schroeder axioms. Because um, Osterwalder Schroeder, you know, this constructive QFT approach has various limitations. It works only tempered distributions and various things. So, so maybe it will not be in that framework at all. It will be in some much more compli complicated framework. And then one has to figure out how to reconstruct the QFT from that. So, so he, this is the problem statement. So this is where I, where I have arrived uh, in half an hour, which you know, I'd like to commend myself for that. You know, I, was, I was trying to figure out how to, how to arrive here, you know, how to tell you the problem, what it means, at least give you an idea without losing everybody. Um, okay. So this is, the, this is the existence problems in a, in a nutshell. So, so you have to take these lattice gauge theories, you have to construct the scaling limit, you have to show it's non-Gaussian, you have to reconstruct the QFT from that. Okay, so this is uh, the, young, uh, the existence problem. Now, uh, what about the mathematical literature? I wrote mathematical literature because there's a huge world of physics literature around that, but I'm only going to talk about the math literature here. Um, now, it's well understood in dimension two, and there are many contributors, so this, this has been figured out in dimension two, space-time dimension two. The challenge is in three and four, and there was a long series of famous papers by Balaban um, where Balaban attempts to prove this existence um, in subsequent limits. Um, so it's not clear what was achieved. So, so, so Balaban proved something about the partition function, but I don't think he really constructed a limit object. Okay. And then there's another attempt in 94. This is also a long paper, but uh, again, it was not clear what was proved in particular because it didn't theorem. Uh, so, um, and in general, this is still considered to be open. Um, so one development that has been going on, so Martin Heyer has this theory of regularity structures, uh, which allowed a different construction of this 543, the 54 theory in three dimensions, via the stochastic quantization approach. And I have heard from Martin that there is ongoing work uh, for 3D Young Mills theories, not for 4D, because 4D is supposed to be the critical case, which is not, you cannot, Presumably, we cannot approach it using regularity structures, but, um, but there is some ongoing work about 3D. Okay. Okay, okay so here's a, here, here's a second problem. Yeah. And I just wanted your opinion. Uh, so even in uh, 2D, I, I'm not sure maybe what you have in mind, but uh, so at least among many physicists, one way to approach it is to not consider the Wilson action, but other actions which have the same scaling limit. So is that something you would also allow in? Yes, uh, yes, yes. So I'm for the you know, for the sake of time, I'm not talking about that. But yeah, Wilson action is not the only action, and there are, there are other actions. And um, yeah, so there, there has been, uh, yeah, 2D, even 2D, I think if you consider on complicated manifolds, it can get very interesting, but uh, at least in the, setting that I was talking just in R2, you know, I think they have yeah. figured out. Uh, that, uh, but in some ways, it may be easier to consider some of these yeah. other actions. Yeah, some other actions, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not immediately clear. Uh, in 2D, it's clear that it's going to be simpler in 2D because you can do gauge fixing and reduce it to a one-dimensional question about one-dimensional random walks, okay, which we understand very well, you know, one-dimensional random walks. Um, I mean, random walks in one-dimensional time. Uh, so, th so that's why 2D is, is, is going to be particularly easy. But why it gets more difficult from 3D to 4D, it's not immediately clear from, from this description. Okay. You don't understand how the um, scaling works as you take as you go to this uh, scaled lattice and and um, 
Yeah, so that's, that's one problem, the, the action, but then you also have to const construct an actual random field. Okay. So, so just like, you know, as I said, Brownian motion is, is a scaling limit of random walk, uh, or, you know, the Gaussian free field scaling limit of other, uh, other things. So you have to similarly show that um, there is some abstract object which is the scaling limit of these theories that epsilon tends to, to zero and you vary beta accordingly. I was going to ask if, if you understand some other things, like the partition function, for example, do you understand how the partition function scales? So the, that, was, that was the investigation of Balaban, which is a series of, you know, 13 or 14 papers, which are famously hard to read, you know, people cannot figure out what was done. But yeah, one can, tr that's, that should be the first step, trying to understand the partition function. Okay. Okay, the second problem, uh, mass gap. So recall that uh, this uh, Hamiltonian H in a QFT, which you may have forgotten, uh, and this vacuum state, so there, there was a Hamiltonian that was coming up, and there was the vacuum state, which, which was the lowest eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, so typically it's taken so that H times omega is zero. And the theory is said to, for, uh, to have a mass gap if there is some positive mu so that any other eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian is bigger than or equal to mu. Okay? So there is a jump between the smallest and the next smallest eigenvalue. And physically, this means uh, is, is that the particles described by the theory have non-zero mass. Okay. So now, how does this relate to the probabilistic objects? So if you go to the probabilistic approach, the mass gap question is equivalent to the question of exponential decay of correlations in Euclidean QFT. So if, you, if you're going to the probabilistic approach, you construct this Euclidean QFT. If you can show that the Euclidean QFT is exponential decay of correlation, then that means that there's a mass gap in the QFT. Okay. Um, so there are various yang mills theories which are supposed to have mass gaps, um, especially you know, non-abelian theories. And the first step, the very first step, even if you are not going to the continuum, is to show that the lattice gauge theories have exponential leak of correlations at large beta. Okay. So that's, that's what you should aim to prove, that these lattice gauge theories that I defined have exponential decay of correlations at large beta. Okay. So, So the thing is, uh, mathematically, it's by now it's very easy to prove exponential decay of correlations at small beta. There are very standard techniques to show exponential decay at small beta. That's not a problem at all. But there is no general method for large beta. We don't know of any, any general technique or any technique at all for, for large beta. Um, there, are, there are simpler models, much simpler models than, than Yang-Mills, where exponential decay is, is supposed to happen, but no one can prove that. So there are these, uh, these things called these ON models which are just easing models, but if you are familiar with easing models, but with not uh, plus minus one spins, but spins taking value on a sphere, for instance. And if that sphere is uh, you know, uh, in 3D or higher, uh, they're supposed to have exponential decay of correlations in two-dimensional easing models at any beta, but none of that has been proved and we, don't, we have no idea. Uh, a, a rare example where this has been proved recently is called this loop ON model, um, where, where exponential decay has been proved in recent times. Okay, but I think it's very special for this model, so there has been no extension. Okay. So that's the general direction, uh, you know, proving exponential decay at large beta. Okay, so now to the third problem. So consider lattice gauge theory on the lattice with gauge group G, and let U be a random configuration of group elements drawn from this probability measure and take a loop, a uh, closed loop, uh, with um, directed edges E1, E2, EM, and, the Wilson and then the Wilson loop variable W gamma is defined as follows. You just take the product of the group elements along that loop, you take the trace of that, take the real part of the trace, and that's the Wilson loop variable. So this is the, the basic observable in a lattice gauge theory, okay? these Wilson loop variables. So if you, if you want to construct a continuum limit, the continuum limit should say something about these Wilson loop variables, that these are the, these are the essential observables. Yeah. And uh, the expected value is generally denoted by this, following usual conventions in uh, statistical physics. So you have this thing. So, so these lattice gauge theories were actually proposed by um, Wilson in 1974, to understand this phenomenon of quark, uh, called quark, quark confinement. 
Uh, so the quarks are elementary particles that bind together to form protons, neutrons, you know, um, heavy particles. And the thing is that the quarks are always bound and are not seen to occur freely in nature. This is called quark confinement or color confinement. Um, and Wilson argued that this phenomenon occurs due to this, due, due to a mathematical feature of Yang-Mills theories that's now called Wilson's area law. So again, skipping a lot of things, just, uh, just a broad overview. So what you have to prove, so this is the third open problem that I promised. Um, so take any four-dimensional non-abelian lattice gauge. So what you have to show is that um, this, uh, this Wilson loop variable, that is, you take this lattice gauge theory and you take any loop and you take the product of the group elements along this loop and you take the expected value of the trace of that. You have to show that the expected value of the trace uh, decays like e to the minus the area enclosed by the loop. Okay? So if you have a loop and area of gamma is a minimum surface area enclosed by this loop, and this, the, you have to prove this upper bound. So, so in general, you can prove without much difficulty, actually, that uh, it's bounded by e to the minus the perimeter of the loop. So that is not so difficult. But, and that is actually the right answer in various, uh, you know, for, for abelian groups in general. For abelian groups, that's, that's the right answer in four dimension. But then you have to move from mm, the perimeter of the loop to the area enclosed by the loop. So this is known as uh, Wilson's area law, and we argued that this is the reason behind confinement, confinement of quarks. That's a physics argument. Um, so it's, it's not math, so in the sense that uh, you, you have to understand the physical model to, to understand why one implies the other, so, so I'll not go into that. Now, um, it's enough if you show it for rectangles. You don't have to show it for arbitrary loops. If you show for rectangles, that's, that's in some sense, that's good, that's good enough. So here's the mathematical history. Uh, for small beta, there's a general proof. So it works for, for any group, essentially. You can show it for small beta, even for abelian groups. But that's not the, the interesting thing. The interesting thing is to prove at large beta. So at large beta, in three dimensions, two, in two dimensions, you can prove it. Not, not difficult. In two dimensions, to prove that the area law holds, you can prove that. In three dimensions, you can prove for U1 theory, even for abelian theory, there is a proof, this is a very complicated paper. Uh, in three-dimensional U1 gauge theory, you can prove this, that the area law holds. Okay. But in, in four dimensions, uh, there is actually a disproof at large beta for four-dimensional U1 theory. Okay. So in four dimensions, which is the real world, uh, you, it, it, for, lar to, to a, for the area law to hold at large beta, it is, uh, it is crucial that this group is non-abelian. Uh, so that was, I think, kind of worrisome for a while that, uh, you know, you are getting this, uh, at small beta, you're getting confinement for any group, but you shouldn't get confinement for a billion, okay, uh, from a physical point of view. You shouldn't get confinement. So actually, this was okay. Uh, I have a comment here. You uh, one gauge theory is supposed to show area law too, you know. So it's not true that the group has to be non-abelian. Uh, but in four dimensions, there... Yeah, the, the compact version of uh, U1, that, that confines. Um, in four dimensions, really? But I, I thought, uh, you know, this, uh, this they, they disproved this for four dimensions. Yeah, that is large beta. Yeah, large beta. But this happens at finite beta. You have a yeah. confining theory. Yeah. Yeah, at, at, at finite beta. Yeah, but for large beta, so that's, that's where I started, at large beta. Yeah, yeah so, so at, you know, at small beta, yeah. So at, at fixed, there is this general proof. Okay, and so finally, there is this fourth problem about gauge string duality. Uh, so so there's, uh, there's this thing about unifying quantum mechanics and gravity. And then, again, very going over very quickly, uh, you know, there, is this, um, there was a discovery in 97 that you know, certain quantum field theories are dual to certain string theories. So these are theories of gravity and these are quantum field theories. Uh, here, duality means that any cal calculation in one theory corresponds to some other ca uh, some calculation in the other theory. 
And this is a big field now in physics. It's called this ADS-CFT duality, or gauge string duality, or gauge gravity duality. goes by various names. So, um, so to establish this, first of all, you know, to establish any kind of result, uh, you have to first construct this quant uh, continuum theories. But even in the discrete theories, um, one can try to show that the expected values of Wilson loops, uh, Wilson loop variables are expressible as integrals over trajectories of strings in a string theory. So this kind of correspondence one can try to show. And there is a lot of activity um, in physics, but almost nothing in math. Uh, maybe because, you know, the mathematicians can't even start here because these are not mathematically defined. So here's what I'm going to talk about in the next, uh, next lecture. Um, so I have this uh, result which um, proves this, uh, that this, uh, at small beta, at least at small beta, you can, you can show that um, Wilson loop variables um, in a large n theory, so I'll talk about that in more details, um, you can express it as, uh, as sums over trajectories in a certain you know, discrete um, string theory on the lattice. But this is a discrete result, so, so there is an open problem here, which is to prove this uh, when beta is large. So the proof I'll show is only for small beta. To prove this when beta is large, um, and we need large beta for passing to the continuum limit. Okay, okay so here's the promised uh, you know, reading list. Um, so for, for probe lists, uh, I have something called Yang Mills for probe lists, so it has more details on all of these topics that I just talked about. Um, and then you have to, if you just want the foundations of QFT, if you want to learn QFT or a mathematician, you want a mathematical perspective, uh, you know, I, I taught a course recently, so there is a set of lecture notes uh, on my website. And these lecture notes in turn are based on uh, this forthcoming book by Michel Talagrand. Uh, this is a terrific book. It's coming out uh, soon, sometime soon. Um, that presents QFT for a mathematical audience. There re really isn't so much about that actually, in the, uh, you know, in the market. Um, Martin Harrer's stochastic quantization approach. Uh, so stochastic quantization is originally due to, due to Parisi, uh, but for, um, for constructing QFTs, that what Martin used to uh, uh, is this for constructing 5-4 theory in three dimensions, give a different proof of the construction of 5-4 theory in three dimensions. Um, there are various lectures and survey, uh, surveys, and, and the, you have also the original papers. Uh, if you want to learn about constructive QF team, um, there is this text, textbook of Glim and Jaffe, and there are various other surveys and expositions. And I'll give more references in the next, uh, next lecture. Okay. Thank you. Which? It is believed that the topology and geometry of the uh, configuration space of Young Mills is very important for all these open questions. In the lattice gauge theory approach, uh, what would be the signals for them? What would be the what? In the lattice gauge theory approach, yeah. uh, what would be the symptoms for the importance of these things? Um, yeah, so, um, so one has to see, you know, what kind of... Um, what kind of smoothness that you, you would get for, um, let's say you're, you're trying to construct a, a continuum limit using Wilson loops. So, so how, uh, how rough these things are, you know, as you change the loop a little, how much does the Wilson loop change? You know, that, that's what would tell you how rough it is. So that's, that's probably what would, yeah, but, you know, I don't know the answer. Right? Of course. Any other questions, comments? I wanted to ask you, so in this approach, you're totally avoiding the uh, Feynman path integral method and the question of the measure over there. And yeah, no, I, I'm not avoiding. So it's just that, you know, I, you know, I was trying to save time. Uh, so so this, uh, this probabilistic approach actually starts with the Feynman path integral because, as I said, this random field that you're constructing, you, you have a target QFT in mind. You want to start with a random field. There should be a connection between these two things. Right. And that's provided by the... Feynman path integral. And the measure is not defined, right? I mean, the... Uh... Well, that's, that's the goal, you know, how do you define the measure? Ah, okay. The, how do you, so for instance, 5-4 theory, three-dimensional 5-4 theory, 
you want to define the measure. Yeah. So you, you start with the QFT, 5.4, and then you have uh, the Feynman path integral representation. And then from uh, that will suggest to you what should be the appropriate measure that you want to construct. But then actually constructing that in a way that you get a non-Gaussian limit, you know, that's, okay. that's the challenge. Okay. And then you have to do various, you know, add these counter terms carefully so that you get a non-Gaussian limit, uh, reach the non-Gaussian fixed point. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> this is about the five, fourth, and three dimensions that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm, I wasn't familiar with the, uh, the works of Hedra and others you mentioned, but uh, do they arrive at this as some kind of a continuum limit of the 3D easing model? Or? No, so what they do is the following. So they, the stochastic quantization approach is the following. You want to construct a probability measure on some abstract space, and then what you do is you try to construct a diffusion process uh, which has that as a stationary measure. Okay? So here, what you're doing is you start with some random field and you make it, try to make it evolve according to some equation so that its stationary distribution is, the, is your target measure. And so, so the, the fact that you can construct this evolution, this is what Martin's program, actually, he, he showed that you can only evolve it up to a certain time, but then there have been subsequent works where they showed that you can do it for all. So is this, the, uh, is this mathematical construction supposed to give what physicists call the Wilson-Fisher fixed point in three dimensions? That, I mean, uh, from a physicist yeah. point of view, the fight to the fourth in three dimension, the non-Gaussian uh, yeah. fixed so, point is supposed so, so, to... So much before this, so, so the original Glim-Jaffe construction, Glim-Jaffe, Spencer, others, what they did in the late 60s, early 70s, they, they, I think they already got that. Uh, the non-Gaussian fixed point of the 543 theory. Um, uh, but, uh, I mean, there are critical exponents, for instance, in the non-Gaussian theory, which are difficult to calculate. Yeah, I, don't, uh, I don't think they got uh, it. Uh, okay, because the correlation functions in the non-Gaussian theory, those exponents are uh, the, uh, supposed to be related to the, what you get from the yeah, 3Ds. I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen, seen but that. maybe you know, I'm ignorant, so maybe, maybe the, it exists, but I haven't seen that. Okay. There are no further questions. Let's thank Saurabh.